first, but let me say congratulations on the Emmy nominations for both you and the series. Really, so many people work so very hard, and I'm just uh, grateful and uh, gratified that that their work uh, has has been noted. Some a uh, truly a, an honor. Yeah, it's wonderful when you see so much work show up on the screen that it's not just the individual. You know, even if it is an individual nomination, it it does speak to what was done. But to have uh, you know have so many different aspects of the show uh, nominated and honored is uh, is really great to see. You know, it's as a fan. I, I think I think every uh, participant, like in, in every show, would would echo your sentiments. I mean, it, it when I say it takes a village, you know, we all we we've all been saying that for years, right? I mean, uh, nobody tells a story in a vacuum. Um, it is all contingent upon everybody else doing um, the best job they can and working um, at a very high level to to pull anything off, man. I mean, it, even down to the independent level, um, but but certainly. For, for something like like Fallout or all the other shows co- nominated in this category. So how did your Fallout journey begin? A, a Zoom call um, with uh, Jonathan Nolan and uh, Graham Wagner and Geneva Dwart Robertson. Um, they they wanted to get on the uh, on a call and and talk about this this property that that they were. Um, adapting or developing, if you will, and uh, and they wanted to speak to me about playing this character called the Ghoul. And um, it was five minutes into the conversation that, without too much effort on their part, you know, I said, "Yeah, I'm in, no matter what it is." And uh, and they said, "Are you sure you don't want to read the scripts first? And I said, nah, "I'm good. I'm okay." And uh, and then you know, lo and behold, they told me it was. Uh, um, a bounty hunter, irradiated cowboy without a nose. And I said, yeah, you know what, maybe I should read those scripts. And, uh, and so I did. And, you know, it took me literally 30 pages into the first script to, to call them back and say, this is one of the best things I've read in a long time. And I'd love to go on this journey with you. That's fantastic. Yeah. It must've been a great conversation to, uh, to have you five minutes in, you know, to have you convinced. It's a great conversation or it's the pedigree, right? Um, I mean, I've been a fan of, of uh, Jonah's since uh, Memento, both uh, he and his brother and and just mm-hmm. all the great work that, that Jonah has done on his own. And, and, uh, and I thought, wow, this is a, a unique opportunity for someone like uh, Jonathan Nolan to really spread his wings. I mean, he's a, he's a very earnest guy. He's a very serious guy. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And this uh, called on him to do something you know, radically different, not what he's usually known for, and that is to to capture uh, this satirical tone that uh, Graham and Geneva set out. Um, it's also kind of baked into the DNA of the show, and I just thought he did it so effortlessly, and uh, it was uh, really a joy to, to to see and to be a part of. So in terms of the characters, why did you want to take on the roles of, of Cooper and the ghoul? What was it about them once you once you got into reading? What hit you? You know, I, I was just taken again with with the story, I, the, the fact that it is satirical. Um, but when it, it when it lands, it lands in a very grounded place. Um, I, I love the, the um, pol- take no prisoners political uh, punches that that it that it throws and observations that it makes about the world. And uh, it was the opportunity to play, you know, a, a, a Western movie star, you know, and uh, and uh, and an irradiated ghoul who was seeing the worst that human beings have to offer. And there was a lot in there for for me to dig into, and um, and and it just uh, felt like it was the right thing for right now. So I'm wondering, what was your approach when you said, "Okay, I've got to tell this story of." Two different sides of the coin, but the same coin. Well, I, I really wanted to understand who Cooper Howard was. Uh, I felt like I needed to understand everything about him and his world, about his um, relationship to his wife and how, uh, who he was as a parent, who he was as a friend, um, where he came from, uh, in order to understand everything that the ghoul has lost, Right. So I kind of retro engineered it um, in, in the sense that we, we start, you know, the opening seven minutes of the show really starts 
in Cooper Howard's world. And it's not even how he ex- how he lives his his life um, by the end of the show. It really starts, you know, months or a year after the show begins the first seven minutes and not many, not too many people have really talked about that. Um, and to understand like who his compatriots were, right. Who who are the people that he was, uh, up against? I mean, I, I don't, I don't think he came to Hollywood to be an actor. I I think he was a, probably a stunt man. Uh, he comes from, you know, very good breeding, very good people, very good stock, if you will, like from the middle of the country and, and uh, and he, you know, could ride a horse and he had a great sense of humor. And uh, one day an actor didn't show up to work and everybody loves Cooper Howard. And the director said, hey, Coop, could you jump in here and say a couple of these lines? And he said, you know, yeah. And he just kind of had a knack for it. And before too long, all of his um, buddies, his stunt buddies uh, were making fun of him and giving him flack because he had his own trailer. And, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of stories in Hollywood kind of begin that way. And uh, and that was really interesting to me. And on the other side of all of it, taking his journey, because he does obviously survive the nuclear apocalypse, uh, instead of just glossing over 200 years of pain and fear, you know, I just really decided to dig into it. We really think about what that what that's like. What, what was it like to it was the first person that he tried to kill? Who was the first person that tried to kill him? And what was it like to be in that scenario? Um, you know, with his daughter, I, if she died or if she's alive, I, that I don't know. Uh, I have my own ideas about it. Um, and what was it like finding shelter? What was it like depending on people? What was it like being betrayed by people? Uh, in order to arrive where we landed with the ghoul, you know, 200 years later and um, having a reputation that precedes him before he walks into a room and a person who's seen it all. He's as wise and as cynical and as indignant as, as anyone. But he also has a sense of humor, uh, very similar to Cooper Howard. He also has a swagger. He also has a, a, a practical, a practical, a, a practicality, a, a, like a, a go, go get them kind of uh, attitude about him. You know, he's pretty. When I say reasonable, I think he just has this this sense about him that is, uh, you know, from from the middle of the country, if you will, and uh, and and that's how I tried to have him speak these two people speak to each other over time. If you, it, it, it was really similar. I watched a lot of movies. I, I, I'm a big fan of the Western genre and I've watched most of these movies many times, but you know, I, I really leaned on, on uh, Henry Fonda in uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. Just extraordinary. What, what a presence that man has. And, and you know, Paul Newman and Butch Cassidy. And, and, um, and I thought, okay, well, those are those. That's a jumping off point, and uh, a little uh, James Arness <laughs> watched a lot of episodes of Gunsmoke and all the rest of it. I love it. That's that's great. That's great insight into it because it's not it, on screen. It's a turn of a page. You you know you go from Cooper uh, to the Ghoul, but there's you know it, if there was a script of the Ghoul or of their life there's about a thousand pages missing, you know, if not more. And you bring that all into the ghoul when you see him on screen. And in th- that moment when the, you know, the mushroom cloud forms and you see the close up of your eyes, there's this subtle look of terror. And like, you know, as a, as a father, you see, you go like, Oh my God, as a father and a husband, you're like, this plants a seed in your head of what, where this life is going. And it's a love story, your father, a dad, and, uh, you you had it all, and you're about to lose everything, or or potentially lose everything, and uh, you know it's just amazing to see. And you wonder like, why is this guy carry on? You know, and and 200 years later, it's it's uh, there's some questions to be answered, which I'm hoping to see you know as we carry on with this series. Thank you very much for saying that. It really means a lot to me. You know, I that that opening sequence when I read it for the first time, um, it was so visceral. I mean, I am a father. And uh, and my son is the most important thing in my life. And um, 
And, you know, in Warren's imagination, this young actor playing my daughter, Miss Scene, was my daughter. And and, um, and I had the privilege, I didn't really realize it at the time when I read the script, but I had the privilege of experiencing um, the ending of the world for all of humanity in our show, right? It's through his eyes that uh, that Cooper gets an opportunity to experience that for not only the audience, but for everyone in the world. And uh, it was a, it was a it was a, it was a real privilege and, and something that that took me by surprise. You know, I, I started this experience. <clears throat> you know, I I started this experience once we began filming <laughs> as the ghoul. <laughs> so I did the research from uh, from Cooper's perspective. And then and then brought that into the world of the ghoul. But when we started shooting, I started with the ghoul. And then that particular day where the bombs were dropped was the first day I played Cooper Howard. And so it was, you know, I guess it kind of came full circle, didn't it? Really? Um, I no one spoke to me as the ghoul. You know, when I came out of the trailer, people were intimidated by me or scared by me or, uh, you know, for whatever reason, people just didn't want to be around me which is not a problem for me i quite like that when i'm working i like to be alone um and it was shocking that for the very first day i came out of the trailer as cooper howard after only being in the chair for five minutes uh how many people said hello to me it was the, it was the and i had been doing it for like a month at, up until this point and uh and and i walked out as as cooper and people just couldn't have been nicer. Hey, Coop, what's going on? You need, need some water? You, are you okay? You're hot. Is, is your grain room right, right over here? You sit in here. You need anything? It, it, and I, it was shocking to me. I was like way too much attention. I couldn't figure out why they were doing that. And then I, I realized that obviously it was because I, I didn't have the makeup on. And uh, and and I it, it caused me a lot of anxiety, to be quite honest with you, because the, the prosthetics and and I suppose his anger his righteous anger was uh, um, a, a bit of armor that I had taken for granted. I was going to say, you probably walk out of that trailer and you're intimidating and you're, you're, and you're probably carrying, you know, you look in the mirror and I know how actors transform um, and you probably unknowingly carrying that out into the world and people are like, Oh shit, I'm not, uh, I'm not talking to that yeah. guy. I, I know who he is, but I don't know who he is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, how much of Cooper is still present in the ghoul when you're playing him? And, and how does that inform your performance? Because it's 200, like, you know, 200 years later, right? I don't know. I don't know the ghoul could answer that question. I, you know, I, I, I try to, I, I don't even believe in playing characters, you know, to be quite honest with you. I know that sounds like bullshit, excuse my language, but, but I don't, I, I believe anything that you put up that, it becomes an obstacle between who you are as a person and who this person is that you're playing. Um, uh, it just makes it harder to do. And so I don't believe these are characters because you know characters are out of a book or I guess out of a movie. You know, I, I believe that these people exist in the world. That's that's the only way I know how to do it. Um, and uh, and so I, you know, I. I I just turn myself over to an imaginary set of circumstances and 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 try to i get i derive just great pleasure from uh trying to uh, keep it as as honest as i as, as i possibly can you know um i, I enjoyed play, playing both of them so so much and and i, and I miss them terribly and i'm uh, gra grateful uh that that i'm going to get the opportunity to do it again and with the big ghoul reveal, which I won't uh, put out here now at the end of the season, what do you hope to explore in season two? Oh God, I, you know this is this is you know from the from the writers, not from me, but I think you know it would also be from me. We're, we just scratched the surface, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Really, in, in season one, and uh, you know I've I've been doing long form storytelling and television for a long time and you're afforded a much longer runway than you are in a movie and and so much is taken up with just introducing and building up the world to people um so and i think that's that's what we did here even though once we started really cooking with gas 
uh, we didn't burn through a lot of story, but we filled in a lot of blanks uh, and um, to set up, you know, what the potential could be for, for season two. You know, I, I don't, I don't, what I, what I, what I don't like is when um, shows or stories take a, a gratuitous turn, right. Just to kind of keep people uh, hooked, if you will. I just think that's a device and I think it's unnecessary if the story is that good. And, and um, I don't believe that that's what we, what we did in this case. I genuinely, genuinely believe that what happens at the end of this show uh, is in, baked into the linear progression of, of this show and, uh, and uh, emotionally and, um, and yeah, we'll see what happens. And I, you know, you, you asked that question earlier about how much of the, 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 the Cooper Howard is left in the ghoul. And I, I can only relate it to my own experience. I mean, is he there? Of course he's there. You know, I was 19 years old when I moved to Los Angeles. I'm 52 years old now. I am not the 19 year old that I was when I moved to LA. Um, but the 19 year old is still in me. I don't know how, I don't know how he manifests, but uh, his naivete and his curiosity, his insecurities, you know, uh, you know, a lot of those have been, have been um, uh, over overcome. It's still, still me. And, and it's not just me, it's you, Stephen. It's, it's everyone, right? We're all who we were at any given moment in our lives and who we are today is impacted by everything that has happened to us. And, uh, and the ghoul is, is no exception. So yeah, the Cooper Howard is in him and um, we'll see what happens, man. Well, I have more questions, but I think that's a perfect way to end off. So I want to thank you for your time today. I want to congratulate you again on, on your work and, and, you know, also being honored, even if you weren't honored, uh, you know, fantastic to see, but it's great to, to hear your name called out during the, uh, the Emmy nominations and I hope to hear your name again. Thank you, know, you so maybe much. Sometime Steven. in September. Well, you know what, my man, like we'll continue this conversation. This is the second one we've had and, and I hope we get an opportunity to do it, to have another one. Same here. Same here. And uh, the 19 year old versions of ourselves can, uh, can continue <laughs> with some cold beer. Yeah, that's <laughs> perfect. Sounds good. We'll see you, Thank Steve. you so much. Have a great day.